Thank you, Abby and Lorna, for reading us um, our scripture reference for today uh, and also for leading us in corporate prayer for praying for us, which is cool. Um, so I feel blessed. You've prayed for me, so it must be perfect. Cool, I can't make a mistake this morning. Great. Oh, now, um, technology has got really cool. Uh, it's got a lot better with computers and stuff. And um, there's a guy um, who has taken some, some fun with AI technology. AI is artificial intelligence. And in, with our computers these days, you can do some cool things. And Tom's not here this morning. I'm going to talk about AI. And he would have been, like, cheering, but he's not here. I can't see him. Poor AI. Is he on, is he on, on Zoom? No. Okay. Okay, we can talk about Tom. So... The, AI is a, is, a, is, a, is a computer ability to take things, and one of the things you can do is you can ask AI to do all sorts of cool things. One of them is the D, uh, is, the, is the one that's called uh, Dale E, not Dale Whitaker, but Dale E. And you type in some words, and it'll come up with a, a, a fake image of the authentic. And this German guy here, he took a real photograph, and then he typed in the words into the computer, and the computer came back with this image here, which is pretty cool. And when you think about it, they, look, they both look kind of real, don't they? Raise your right hand if you think oh, the one on the right is the real one. Raise your left hand if you think the one on the left-hand side is real. Okay, raise your hand if you have no idea. Okay, most of you. Yeah, it's actually quite surprisingly um, similar. Now, the answer here is the one on the right is actually the real one. Yes, there you go. Um, and in the description, the AI computer got it wrong. It said wearing a red T-shirt and a black sweater. It actually reversed around. But generally, these AI technology can search the internet, pull up heaps of information, and put them together, which is pretty scary. Here's another one. The guy took a real photograph in Japan of a street corner, and he typed in the words. Now, Nobu, you're from Japan. Which one is real? The one on the right or the one on the left? The left. No, actually, it's the one on the right is the real one. Okay? Now... If you read the description, it said on a corner, and it didn't get a corner, and it said small windows, plural, but it has a big window. So this, this technology is able to draw in information and put together pictures. And who's seen the, the one of Tom Cruise, the deep fake of Tom Cruise on TikTok? Okay, no one's seen TikTok? It's pretty cool. I mean, it's 20 seconds long, and the guy looks like Tom Cruise. He talks like Tom Cruise, but it's not Tom Cruise. It's just taking his whole face and then put another face on top of it. So um, it's, it's pretty cool stuff, pretty scary stuff too. Um, in New Zealand, we have um, a, a $5 note, and um, it's pretty cool. And we have in New Zealand some real ones and some fake ones. Now, raise your hand if the one on the right-hand side is the real one. Raise your hand if you're on the left-hand side is the real one. Rob, you've put, you put your hand up for both. Oh, you can only do it once. This one or this one, Rob? This one, okay. So you've got two. Who doesn't have any idea? No, it's kind of hard, isn't it? Okay, so what I need now is I need a volunteer. Okay, come on up here, Ruben. You put your hand up first. Sucker, come on up here. <laughs> I thought Abby was going to put her hand up first. Okay, I'm going to give both these to Ruben, all right? And I want you to have a look at them. There's, there's, um, one is authentic, one is not real. Tell me which one is the real one and which one is the authentic one. Don't take too long. There's only 300 people watching you. I think. This is the real one. Okay, how can you tell? Because I think you can look at the pattern on the, on the little... On the yes, very cool. You got a little pattern there? Yeah, and this one doesn't have a pattern. You're supposed to look, feel, and tilt. That's what the Reserve Bank says. So you got a little, you got a little window there, but it's got a little window. But it's, it does, but there's no pattern. There's no pattern. What about if you look through the little... You can see the queen. Queen's yeah. And actually, some of them glow. The new ones actually glow which is really, really cool. Okay, Ruben, I've got another question for you. So this is the bad one, right? And this is the good one. Which one would you like to keep? Would you like, if I gave it as a gift to you, would it the authentic one or the fake one? This is a trick question. No, no trick question. Probably the good one. There you go. Okay, you can have, now I'm going to rip the bad one. Actually, it's paper, so it can actually rip, so you can even tell. Okay, there you go. Thank you. That's the right choice. Now, I have a magical trick. I can re make the money reappear. Look, it's now not in his hand. <laughs> no, no, it's, 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 in my, it's in my pocket. Okay, so um, in my line of work over the years, I've always been asked the question, uh, is that an authentic church? Are those guys over there Christians? And usually it's an authentic question. They're not trying to put a particular church down or a particular group of people down, but they've changed locations or they have to change church. And they have this question, 
Who are the authentic followers of Jesus? And I can see we've got our Jackie's back from her long holiday. And she's probably been asking this question as well. You know, is this church I'm going to is an authentic church? How do I understand? You know, what is an authentic church? Now, the answer to that question is not looking for a bumper sticker. That's a fish, okay? doesn't matter if they have a fish on their bumper. Who has a fish on their bumper sticker? Anyone got a fish on their car? No one's got a fish on their car. Okay, we have no authentic Christians in this room. Okay. So a fish symbolizes Christians, okay? It's an ancient symbol for Christians. But it's not the authentic symbol. The passage we've read today in 1 Thessalonians tells us about the authenticness, the authentic aspects of the Christian faith. And so we're going to be going through that. And um, it doesn't give us the complete, comprehensive, extensive one. You have to read the whole Bible to understand the authenticness of Christianity. But here we're going to get a few of the aspects that are going to tell us about it. Now, as a church, we've just stopped reading um, uh, Amos, and now we're reading First Thessalonians. And for me personally, I feel a little bit jaded. A jaded meaning like, whoa, what's going on? Because in Amos, you've got these people who are terrible. They have, a, they have destroyed their relationship with God. They're not authentic. And now we pick up the book of Thessalonians, and these guys are great. There's no major problems. In the other book embarrassing. They had more than a page long of things that they did wrong. And some of the, the sins they did, I felt uncomfortable even reading about. They were pretty awful. Pages and pages of, of terrible things. So in the, in the book of Amos, you see this. Your walk with God is not authentic, so change. And the prophet Amos came and said, get your life straight. And they didn't. So God had to take them into a exile. He took them into Australia for a few years. And then in the first book of First Thessalonians, we see the opposite. Your walk with God is authentic. It's the real deal. So continue. And so that's what we're doing today. We're looking at this, this book, which talks about these people who have an authentic walk with Jesus. And I've called our series Continuing the Course in Jesus, because that's what we're looking at. We're looking at a role model, a really cool church that we go, wow. Who found the book of Amos hard to read through? Yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty sad, wasn't it? This one is going to be encouraging. It's the real deal. So why should they continue? We're going to be listed a whole bunch of things that they should continue. And the three things that are going to be uh, talked about are these. The three signs of the authentic walk with Jesus. The pathway, the authentic pathway of following Jesus. And the visible example of the authentic followers of Jesus. And so we're going to look at these, which are going to be pretty cool. Now these here are actually embedded in a prayer. Paul and his team, Silas and Timothy, are praying. And this is the normal part of a letter. When you read one of the New Testament letters, you will see a prayer at the beginning. And so we see there in verse 2, we give thanks. So the team is giving thanks for these guys because they're the authentic thing. And so what we're going to do is going to draw out of the context from their prayer. We're kind of being a little bit rude. We're looking at their prayer and keeping our eyes open and going, what's the content? What's going on here? Which is really cool. Normally, you should close your eyes. So... In this prayer, it's very emotional, it's very passionate, um, it has a lot of tones of emotion. And you can see this through the participles. You'll see a bunch of participles there. Remembering you, mentioning you, we knew you. And these participles communicate the manner, the cause, the context of what's going on. Also, secondly, you'll see the emotions there is because Paul uses um, a alliteration. And that is the idea where you take um, a, uh, some words and you start with the same letter. So I have a little example here for you. I have heard how hedgehogs hog the hedge. And so the hedgehogs replies by saying this, but we scoff sticky slugs. And so this idea of, uh, of these words being put in a particular order sort of um, expresses Paul's love, his emotion, and his care for what he's talking with them. So I've, for you in yellow, highlighted the words in the Greek that appear with the word P. And so you kind of have to use your imagination here and feel these participles going on and also feel the language going on. I've done my own attempt to translate it for you. I've translated it like this for you. We give thanks to God permanently, purposely of each person, consistently pointing you out in our prayers. And so when they read this, they felt this beautiful prayer. They felt the emotions. These people spoke Greek. 
He had ministered to many Romans that spoke Greek, but now he's in Thessalonica, and they speak really good Greek. And so they would have appreciated it. They would have taken this on. They would have felt these, this emotional, beautiful prayer. But for us, we're going to have a look at the content. The first part of the content we're going to see is the three signs. And the first sign that we see is work produced by faith. And the NIV does a good job here. Uh, ESV says um, work of faith, which is great, but the NIV has a better way of just translating the original meaning, which is it produces it. Now, work is something that we normally do. It's an activity we go about. You've all done some kind of work this week, whether it be washing, going to the shop, buying something, or just going to sport. But also, it carries an idea of an ethical sense, of a wholeness. So it's a wholeness action that we all do. It's a general term. So it can be anything to do with like looking after the poor, uh, putting away idols, sharing the gospel, sharing financial resources, putting on a party for a friend, the way your honesty in your, in your work life or in your social life. And so it's a general term. So where does this wholesome act come from? It comes from faith. So faith here has this idea of faith in Jesus Christ. You'll also see at the end of verse 3, it says, in our in our Lord Jesus Christ. So the object here of faith is not faith in its faith, but it's actually faith in a person. And who is this person? The Lord Jesus Christ. Lord meaning he is God. Jesus is his, is his real name. And Christ meaning he is the Messiah, the one that would die for our sins. Now how is this work produced? By being in and putting our faith in Jesus Christ. So when I go for a run, I sweat. My wife doesn't like that, but that's what happens. I don't sweat to go for a run. I sweat because I'm running. I don't sit there on the couch and go, oh, I want to start sweating. It doesn't happen that way. I can try really hard. Sweat, sweat, sweat. doesn't happen. I sweat because I go running. And same with this passage. Our wholesome actions come by our faith in Jesus Christ. And that's a really important point. And sometimes we get it mixed up. We go around the other way. Oh, I've got to try and live the Christian life. I've got to try and do this. No. When we place our faith in the person, then it comes. When we go for a run, sweat will naturally come, and people won't want to sit by you because you smell. Or in our case, they'll sit with you because you have wholesome actions. So the concept is not personal ability. We don't have faith in our personal ability, which produces actions. We have faith in what Jesus Christ has done. The second one there is labor. We have the idea of labor of love. Once again, the NIV is pretty cool. It talks about labor produced by love, which is really, really cool. And so it is this idea, it's a general word again, of work, of, of interacting with people. But this time it has the idea of um, engaging in hard work. Something that's not easy. Kind of like uh, doing a puzzle. It's not easy. You don't give in, which is pretty cool. So how is this labor achieved? By love. Once again, love for who? Love for God. We love the Lord our God. We love others, not ourselves. And the third one, the third authentic uh, sign here is hope. The idea of hope. And this hope produces the ability to endure, to carry on. Now, where's the hope? Hope in herself? No, once again, it's hope in Jesus Christ. I like how Richard Mayhew says it. Hope towards Christ's return produces unlimited level of commitment. When we know Christ is coming back, our actions and our ability to change. Now, my wife's here this morning, which I was hoping she wouldn't be. When my wife is about to come home, and I've been home all day alone, I start thinking, what am I supposed to do? Because she's now about to turn up, you know? So quickly I think, oh, you've done that, done that, yes. Same with when we understand that we're living today, but we're also living for tomorrow, it changes the way we behave because we have a love in Jesus Christ. And it's very, very powerful. So it's not hope and hope, but hope in, in the person of Jesus Christ. So these are the three authentic symbols or signs of our, of our relationship with Christ. It's our work produced by faith in Jesus, our labor of love, and our hope of what's going on, which is cool. So our authentic sign is not our worship style. Although we have cool worship, Matt and the team led great worship. It's not your building style. It's not how cool a building you have. It's not the style of the clothes you have. It's not the style of the pastor. Now, you have a really cool pastor, but it's not the style of the pastor. It's actually our hope in Jesus Christ, not our hope in what we have. So 
The hope in Jesus Christ produces this amazing, different reality that people will see. So the question for us is this. How is your faith and hope and love in Jesus going? Where are you putting the energy of your life? Now, these are classic. If you read through the New Testament, you'll see these three, these trio, coming up all the time. Sometimes the duo comes up a lot. And they are Paul's favorite ones. And they're right throughout the Bible. And they're pretty cool. Uh, for example, 1 Corinthians 13, 13. It says this. So now, faith, hope, and love abide. And of these three, the greatest of these is love. Cool. Because love is the one that doesn't finish. When our hope comes... When uh, life is finished, we're with Jesus, so love actually lasts. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8. But we certainly believe belong to the day. Let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of hope, the salvation. So these ideas go right throughout Scripture. You'll see them in Galatians 5, uh, 1 Peter 21. You'll see them in Hebrews. It's kind of like, you know when you, you learn about a new car in life, and then you Go for a drive, and then you see that car everywhere. You know, when you first learn about a Tesla, then you see them everywhere. Or you learn about a Honda Civic, you see them everywhere. As you read through Scripture, you will notice these three signs of the authentic follower of Jesus. They're everywhere. We could say more, but let's move on. The second um, authentic uh, sign is the pathway. There is an authentic pathway uh, for the believers of Jesus Christ. You'll see in verse 4. We know, brothers, you are loved by God. Now, where does this pathway lead to? It leads to the word brothers. They become brothers in verse 4. Now, this is a beautiful, deep theological truth here that Paul shares. They are brothers. The word brothers actually holds the idea of brothers and sisters. It's written to both male and females. And so both male and females have this beautiful, spiritual Ability to be in the family of God, which is so, so cool. They're not half-brothers. They're not weird cousins, half-siblings. They're not avatars, although who wants to be an avatar? Okay, some of you do. They're not avatars. They're actually the real thing. They're not outsiders. They're not tourists. They're not visitors. They're actually brothers. So this pathway leads to being in the spiritual family of God. Now, remember, most of these people were Greeks. Right? Paul would have not hanged out with them before. They're Greeks. He wouldn't have eaten with them. He wouldn't have gone to talk to them. He would have avoided them. But now there's a spiritual reality. Once we come to Jesus Christ, we become brothers and sisters. This is a very powerful spirituality. You're no longer just a visitor. Okay, We're the Jewish people. You're welcome. No, actually we're brothers and sisters. This is a very powerful statement. A confusing statement, but a very powerful one, which is cool. And so how does this happen? It happens in the gospel. So we see here Paul, he'll lay out four qualities, the four pathways of the gospel. The gospel refers obviously to what? The good news of Jesus Christ. The gospel is the summary of the whole of this epic thousands of years story of God's redemption. And I describe it this way. The uh, the gospel is this, God's relationship, redemption of mankind through Jesus Christ. Now, obviously, that's pretty inaccurate because you've got all these books of the Bible and this massive story. But that would be my personal sort of definition of the Bible. God's relationship, redemption of mankind, of both of us, through Jesus Christ. Now, if you want a short one, you can look at uh, 1 Corinthians 15. It gives you a short definition of the gospel. Verse 3 says this, For I... Delivered to you, first of all, what I received, that Christ died for our sins, according to Scripture, that he was buried and he was raised, to, raised on the third day, according to the Scripture. So that's a short one. If you want a long one, read through the book of Romans, okay, and you're going to die. The um, book of Romans will give you a full definition of the gospel. Sometimes I find it kind of strange how I overlook the foundational importance of the gospel. Kind of like, oh, yeah, the gospel, it's the good news. But it's strange that sometimes I just, I just don't realize how important the gospel is. Di searched um, one of the chat G GBTs. Boy, that's hard to say. We'll just call it chat. 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 GPT. Um, Di looked it up and asked that question. What is the deepest of human needs? 
And um, amongst other things, obviously it said water and shelter and protection. But then it went on to say these words. The need for connection and belonging is often regarded as the foundational need that underlines and enhances our overall well-being. If you want well-being, you need to have connection with other people. Human beings are social creatures by nature. We thrive when we have meaningful connections with others. We have an innate desire to be seen, to heard, to understand, and to love for those we are with. Deep down, we long for relationship. So, chat GPT tells us the true answer, that we actually need relationships. Sure, we need water and power and video games, but apart from that basic stuff, we actually desire a relationship. Now, if you've been around for a while, you know that we have a problem with relationships. We are good at destroying relationships. We, we're not very good at developing relationships. There's lots of mud. There's lots of poo in relationships. And it destroys it. And so we know there's a problem. We know that actually our greatest need is actually is a relationship. But we know there's a problem. And the cool thing, on a spiritual level, we agree. We know this is one of the fundamental needs that we have. We know where this problem comes from, the Garden of Eden. As humans, we chose that fruit, we rebelled against God, and we broke our relationship with God and each other and ourselves. And now when we try to talk to someone, there's this mud. And we try to talk to God, there's this mud. And when we try to talk to ourselves, there's this mud, this brokenness, this darkness that scares ourselves. And the good thing is that what? The gospel. The gospel has come. God's redemption of mankind through Jesus Christ. Our greatest need is now being answered, which is so cool. We should type into GP, what's the answer to broken relationships? Hopefully it would come up with the word gospel. I'll have to do that next. So, Paul lays out the gospel for us. The gospel, first of all, comes in words. Or the prepositional phrase you can say, with words. The gospel comes with words. God has given us the ability to communicate, to use words and prepositional phrases, and we have a vocabulary. And in that vocabulary that he gave us, he communicated his word. And so we have the story, we have the ultimate truth of God. We have the accurate truth of God's word, which is so cool. Romans 10, 17 says this. So faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. So we have the word of Christ the word of God, in our scriptures, given to us. Jesus himself said in Matthew 4.4, 4, Man does not live by bread alone or PlayStation, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so we recognize this is where we can learn about the gospel. It's accurate. Um, oh, actually, the second one is there in power. We see there in verse 5, our gospel came to you not only in word, but in power. Now, Paul is not saying it's not about words. Words are really important, but there's another ingredient, which is the ingredient of, of with power, the ability. The word of God actually comes with an amazing ability to change us, to help us to restore our relationship. It's not just intellectual words or a good story. There's something very powerful that can work in our lives. As Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, I've cut my finger a number of times. Who's cut their finger? Okay, the word of God is sharper. It can divide our soul, our bones, our thoughts, and, and, and bring us to where we need to be. It's a powerful word. I like what uh, Leon Morris uh, says. Now, he's an Australian, so I do apologize for mentioning his name. But Leon uh, mentions this word. He says this. It is not simply that the, the Bible, the gospel tells about power, but the gospel is power. So it's not just telling us a powerful story. When we hear that story, it's actually powerful as well, which is cool. Now, Spurgeon said this, which I like. The scripture is a lion. Who's ever heard of defending a lion? Just turn it loose and it will defend itself. And so the scriptures is actually alive. It's active. It's powerful. And that's why we read one or two verses and it really it speaks to us. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20. For the kingdom of God does not consist of talk, of just words, but also power. The third one you'll see there is in the Holy Spirit or with the Holy Spirit. 
Paul mentions the person of the Holy Spirit. This is the divine person of God. God is actually involved in this process. He's actually named. But we know from the rest of Scripture, it's not just one part of it. It's actually right through the process. The Holy Spirit inspired Amos to speak the word of God. Uh, the Holy Spirit reveals the word of God to our mind and our heart. The Holy Spirit convicts us. Um, the Holy Spirit enables and puts the power, which we've just seen. And the Holy Spirit helps us to live. And so the Holy Spirit's involved in the whole process, but he gets a mention here, which is really cool. And then fourthly, full of, uh, of, uh, of certainty. We see there that the gospel comes with certainty, deep certainty. Now, although human experience is subjective, there is a certainty in our subjectiveness. We can have assurance of what we have. The word of God has come to us. We've had the, the power. We've had the Holy Spirit speak to us. Now, Reuben's taken my $5 note. It's now his gift. Now, Reuben, you have assurance that that $5 note is good and that you're going to use it. You have me. I'm not the Holy Spirit, but I've told you it's authentic. Uh, you've checked out the accuracy. You've seen the authentic symbols. You've seen through the little picture, the little symbol. And this week, hopefully, you're going to spend it. Are you going to spend it on something? What would you like to buy? Oh, wow, that's cool. Very cool. So you're going to have confidence. You're going to pull out that $5 note, and you're going to buy that hot chocolate, right? And that's what we have with the Christian faith. We have the authentic words. We have the power. And we have this, this subjective confidence because we've seen all this happen. And so you're going to buy a hot chocolate. I hope it's not $5. I hope you get change. Probably not. And you get some change, which is cool. So likewise, in our relationship with God, this broken, muddy thing that we have can be completely restored. Now, this pathway is dynamic. The gospel doesn't just happen at one time. It actually continues to flow. We gospel every day. We gospel in our relationship every day at work, at home, in our sports life. The gospel comes into us. We hear God's words of transformation. We experience the power, and we have this flow. So it's not a stable stop finished. It carries on. It flows throughout, through our time, which is cool. Now, um, when you think about these, these, the pathway, if you were the enemy of God, and you're not because you're good people, if you were the enemy of God, what would you do against these pathways? And I've taken this idea from the book of C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called um, Screwtape Letters. Who's read it? Oh, good. Lots of people. And in this book, he talks about a senior devil's advice to a junior, junior devil's how to keep his human away from God, from coming to God and abiding in God. And I was thinking about that idea, and I was thinking, what would you do to keep humans away from God's word? Well, the first ingredients there, you would say, well, God's word's not that accurate. It's not really what we should be looking at. It just causes problems. You know, we shouldn't trust it. You know, we should do some, use some research or something else. You might be better to leave the word of God out at the beginning, maybe introduce it later on. But if you look at this system here, the first thing is mentioned is the word of God. We bring them the word of God, not other things first. Now, if you were talking about the power of God, what would you do? You'd say, oh, there's no power today. It's just our own ability. Don't rely on God's power working through you. You need to run hard for God. You need to work hard. Don't rely on what God, God's done for you on the cross. But actually, we know that the, there is power. The Holy Spirit. If you were uh, a, a senior devil, you say, oh, there's no such thing as the Holy Spirit. He's not around. You're all by yourself. Don't rely on the Holy Spirit. And in fact, in, 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 fact, some, in some ways, uh, I think the devil's done a good job. There's a book written by Francis Chan. Who's read this book? Forgotten God. One person at the back. Well done. Who is at the back? Oh, yeah. Cool. Well done. You've read the Forgotten God book. And it's quite an apt title because I think in some ways we've forgotten the Holy Spirit. Satan's done a really good job of trying to take away the pathway to the gospel. And so we need to realize, actually, we're not on our own. We can pray. God walks with us. What does Psalm 23 say? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want because he walks with me through the values. He's actually with us. God is actually with us, which is really, really, really cool. Um, oh, go back one more. Uh, in full confidence, we'd say, look, there's no confidence today. You can't know anything. 
Reuben, you shouldn't be confident going up to buy that hot chocolate. In fact, just leave that in your pocket. Maybe give it back to me. It's not real. Don't, don't, don't rely your life on that. Live your life like it's not real. Just put it in a cupboard somewhere. Never use it. But actually, we know that it's actually real. It can make a difference and get you a hot chocolate, which is cool. Okay, let's move on for the sake of time. The last one here is uh, the visible examples of the authentic uh, Jesus follower. And so here we see that Paul and his team have received the word of God themselves. They were converted. And they lived out the gospel. They were examples. So they imitate Christ and their examples to others. We see that in verse 5. You know what kind of men we prove to be. So they were examples. The gospel to transform their lives. They were able to be examples to others because of Jesus. And they were able to imitate Jesus because he is God. Not only this, but we see that the Thessalonians also went on to the same thing. They received the word of God, verse 6. The gospel came to them. They became visual examples to others and imitators of Christ, just like they did. These aspects uh, still continue today. They don't stop. And we see there that what's happened in verse 8, the word of God sounded out. It's kind of like a trumpet. Imagine hearing a trumpet. Verse 8, the word of God spread because of what they did. And their faith spread everywhere. And this example, this role model, continues and continues. It doesn't stop. Today, we're sitting here because that community in, in that place of the world, part of Europe, started sharing the gospel with other people, who shared it with other people, who shared it with us here at ABC. And here at ABC, we're the ones that now have the responsibility to share it with others. And that's one of the authentic marks. As a community, we now have the obligation and the privilege of imitating Christ. And I don't kind of like that word imitation. It kind of sounds weird, doesn't it? But we're not imitating perfection. We're imitating that we need the gospel in our life, that I'm not perfect, that your pastor makes mistakes, that you make mistakes, but Jesus has forgiven me. He's changed my life. There's a radical change because I want to go this way to the mud and he wants to take me to this pure water that we celebrated today. So that's our responsibility. A number of years ago, we had a new neighbor in the back fence who uh, became our new neighbor. And it was pretty cool. They have a swimming pool. So I always make, I always make friends with a new neighbor that have a swimming pool. And they were from Auckland. So it's like, oh, they're from Auckland. Never mind. Um, but he's a good guy. He's a good guy. He started going to our church, which is really cool. He's a Christian family. And I got talked to him over the fence, and I said, um, you know, uh, how was your journey with Christ? He said, oh, I was very lucky. I went to a really good church. They, they were great examples to me and my family and my kids. They imitated Christ. They preached the word of God, and they really helped me grow in Jesus. And I said, that's really cool. He said, I'm also enjoying our church in Cambridge. And so I said to um, my neighbor, and his name was Cameron Gillard. Anyone know him? Yeah, a few of you know him. So I said to him, that's really, really cool. And he said, I said, what church did you go to? He said, I went to ABC Church. And I said, oh, that's really cool, ABC Church. I've heard that church. And that's not the first time I've heard those words. I went to this church, and they're a really good example. And that's what we're called to be here at this church, to be a really good example, not in our own strength, but in what Christ did for us on the cross. Now, this week, we have the opportunity through our relationships in sports, in golf, in tennis, at work, in buying a hot chocolate or selling a hot chocolate, or whatever we're doing, we have the opportunity to be the examples to others, not because we're perfect, but because we know there's someone who is, and we can imitate Christ, because that's the best form of, of learning. And that's cool. And so, in summary, we have these three things. We have the three signs of the authentic Christian, we have the pathway of the authentic Jesus follower, and they have the visible sign. And so this week, all of us are the authentic $5 note, the spiritual $5 note that's going to go through circulation. It's going to go through our economy. And people might, take your, might look at you for two seconds. Others will look at you for a long time. And the longer they look at you, they will see whether you're authentic or not. Reuben took a little bit of time, but he worked at it originally at the end, which is really cool. Now, some of you are saying to me, what well, Hayden, they had Paul, and we have only got you. <laughs> That's true. But let me say this. They only had Paul for three Saturdays. If you look in Acts chapter 16, 17, 
You'll see he was there for three Saturdays. That's the, the day they worshipped God. He taught them in the synagogue, and then he worked making tents, and then he got kicked out of town. And then a year later, he wrote them a letter, this letter. And so we don't have to wait 15 years to start imitating, to start being the real authentic thing. God can change our heart today. We can spend three weeks hearing about the gospel, the truth of it, and say, right, I've had enough of trying to be good myself or put my identity in this idol or that idol. I'm going to give my life to Christ. And in three weeks, we can actually take a hold of the gospel, take that $5 note out, and actually start using it in our economy, which is so cool. And so one of the goals, I think, for us as a community, from now to the next year, we want to be a community that people hear about transformation, that we share transformation with other people. The hope there is transformation. That's the, one of the signs of an authentic community. So we are, we are not a social club. Yes, we have good friends. Um, we have good music. Thank you, Matt. Uh, we, have, we have lots. We're not a Bible club. We do have good theology. But what we are is a transformational group of people because of what Jesus has done in our life, which is so cool. So um, the worship team are going to come up in a second. And before they do, I'm just going to close in prayer and I'm going to pray for us. Father God, I want to thank you for the gospel that came to us in word, the truth of the gospel that came with power through the Holy Spirit, Lord. And thank you that we can have confidence to apply the gospel in our lives this week. Lord, I thank you that we have uh, the role models like, like Paul and many other Christians who have gone before us, Lord. And Lord, I thank you that we can lean into their example and we can be an example to the world around us. Not that we are perfect, but we have found the perfect Jesus. Lord, I pray that this church, within the next year, will be a testimony to Aucklanders, Lord, about who Jesus is. That we'll be a testimony to the word of God. And Lord, I pray that more people will join Jesus through our, our, our fellowship, Lord. I pray more people in Auckland, they need Jesus, Lord. Our greatest need is what? Jesus. A restored relationship with God. And so I pray for the gospel to go powerfully through our community in the next year. And all God's people said... Amen. Thank you, Matt. Whoa.